Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just too overwhelmed, really, by, by everything. But I want to just start off by thanking Morg and Matteo and Liz once more for putting this together, um, you know, taking time out from their own work that is going so amazingly to, to do this stuff uh, is just incredible. So thank you again. Um, and I don't know about this keynote, this is certainly an end note anyway, I see what I'm doing today, it's like a little end note, it kind of comes underneath an awful lot of the talks, it kind of should, should hook into a lot of things that have been said across the two days actually, the epistemic phenomenology stuff from yesterday too. Um, and when I got up this morning I thought, you know, the worst thing about this is everyone's going to think it's far too intellectualist the kind of picture that I'm presenting. Um, but I realised that, that Barbara's talk does exactly what I needed just before that because it suggests that in a kind of microcosm the ants are already doing this. Um, so I'll, I'll try and bring that out as, uh, as I go ahead. So what's going on? Um, thank everybody. Thank um, also Peter Odin and OUP. Thank Dan Dennett. Thank to all the contributors, um, many of whom are, are in this room. Um, thank you so much. It's just incredible. Um, this is another Remedius Varo. I really like her paintings. This one is embroidered in the earth mantle. These people are busy doing stuff to the earth in a very sort of, you know, embroidery kind of way. And I think that's one of the things that I'm going to try and pull out here is how important it is that we embroider the earth in ways that kind of help us make our predictions come true, that, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, basically, what, I, what the essays made me do is wonder, which I never bothered to do before, how it all fits together. You know, you just go on, you do one thing, then you do another thing. Um, and I kind of... You know, there's this elegant picture of the prediction error minimizing brain. And then there's this other picture that I've looked at that you might think of the messy, heterogeneously constituted, um, extended mind, that sort of bag of tricks that lets us get through the day. Um, and there's a sort of question, as I, I think Jesse Prince almost put it this way, um, can I really have that many cakes and, uh, and eat them too? Uh, and as you know, I've never been scared of a, <laughs> never been scared of a bit of cognitive bloat. So, um, so I'm going to have a go. Um, Jesse also said yesterday that I told him years ago you should never show a plan because it's a waste of time. <laughs> I'd obviously forgotten that message. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the main thing about this plan is I'm going to do those things and if there's time for a dessert at the end I will do this like a Guardian blind date or a, a, a New York Times um, modern love thing when messy mind met elegant brain. We'll see. See how it all ended. So, um, I'll start here with something out of the volume, some ecological psychology style worries that um, Anderson and Camero raised. They said that maybe a common construction of PP downplays ecological information. There's all this information around us and maybe um, PP is sort of downplaying that a little bit by suggesting that we need rich internal models to deal with the world. Is there a spurious puzzle how to deal with an impoverished signal and then you get these rich inner models as a solution to the puzzle that you shouldn't have had in the first place. Um, so the, 
the shape of the sort of reply that, that, that I want to give, and that I'll give again and again through this talk, is that what the rich models are doing, they're really just contextualizing again and again and again. And I've come to think that contextualizing is what brains are for, that basically um, sort of having bodies of information that you can con contextualize and recontextualize and recontextualize, somehow that's the sort of fundamental trick that these hierarchical sorts of systems um, enable you to perform. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of big picture. The case that they start with is the way we humans subtly sway if we're doing a precision aiming task. So, for example, rifle shooting or archery. And apparently, if you set this up properly, you can see that people just sway in ways that are rather task-specific when they're, when they're performing these kinds of, um, these kinds of operation. It, uh, it's a way of bringing forth the information that you need in the right way at the right time. And that sort of inactivist bringing forth of the right information at the right time is, um, is what I want to um, pull on quite hard. So they had false monitoring platforms and laser pointers and all kinds of cool stuff. And they, they just showed that you're actively creating optic flow information that is suitable for the task. So there's all kinds of optic flow that you could be creating. And precision aiming takes a particular kind. Um, they do say PP can accommodate those kinds of scenarios, and that's probably true. PP is very, very good at accommodating. Predictive processing is great. You give it to us, we'll accommodate it. Um, but I do think that there's a sort of elegant and deep fit here, and it's the elegance and depth of this fit and the way that you flow straight from there through the use of Google up to the extended mind and out the other side at all time scales is kind of what, I'm, what I want to put on the table. Um, so I think that they miss the deep continuity that you can get out of PP between these kinds of strategy and stuff that looks a lot more intellectualist. So the other way of looking at these models, I think, is that they sort of pull the rug out from under intellectualism. They don't sort of puff it up so much as bring it down. You know, what we're doing in these highly recontextualized intellectualist looking things is very much like what the ants are doing when they, as it were, estimate that uh, they'll reduce more prediction error if they go in this direction now than if they go in that one. That's a very, very little temporally shallow version of what I want to suggest um, brains like ours are busy doing too. So uh, that means basically you try and reduce everything like that to a kind of epistemic action. This goes back to Kirsch and Maglio's old work. Uh, the idea there was that, you know, sometimes we act to improve our state of information, not just to get us closer to a pragmatic goal. Often, in fact, you will get further from your pragmatic goal, but you get further away in order to improve your information so you get there better. Um, what you get out of PP, and the reason that I, I, I sort of see it as a, a good way of, of bringing embodied cognition and these sorts of things together, is you get a, a systematic model of how and when epistemic action will occur. So when I looked at it, say, back in um, being there and so on, it was just like, well, epistemic action, it's a good thing. We do quite a lot of it. But actually having a model that says, and this is exactly when you're going to do it and why you're going to do it, that would be a step forward. So, now I get to, there's a lot of words in this talk, and I apologize for that, but at least we started today with Jess's um, graphic novel version with less, less words. Um, so, preferences in these predictive processing stories are just highly expected outcomes, and I've heard them spoken of as target priors. So that seems like a, a good thing to get on the table. Planning and action control aim at these target priors by trying to reduce future prediction error. So the idea is this is expected free energy, if you like, future prediction error under different action plans and policies. And again, that can all sound highly intellectualist, but I don't think it should. So, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully it won't look so intellectualist soon. Um, these are orangutans, or one orangutan with a stick. Um, and what the orangutan is doing with the stick is kind of trying to work out whether it's a good idea or not to jump in the water at, at, at this point. And so, you know, having a stick and probing and sampling the environment here is being used to um, get the kind of information that lets the orangutan reduce uncertainty about uh, a near future action, um, getting in the water there. Okay. So what's happening there is this move towards looking at expected future prediction error. And I do think that once you start looking at expected future prediction error, some things start to look a bit different. It starts to look as if the main thing that's different, if at all, about the human brain or higher animal brains is they just have deeper temporal models. And that means that they can do a kind of richer job 
of minimizing expected future prediction, or at least they can do it further into the future. Maybe that's the fundamental thing about them. Yeah, okay. So you can have a very long-term goal, and what you would want to do in the, in the present here is take a short-term action that may take you a long way away from that goal because it's a good way of moving into the future. Um, so maybe there's this sort of single currency story here that you don't need to think about sort of epistemic action and pragmatic action in different terms at all. Maybe that's a sort of artifact almost of our, our folk psychological take on our, on our own minds and actions. Maybe it's just one fundamental thing that's going on here, which is selecting the action that best minimizes prediction error across some time scale or other. Sometimes that's going to involve what looks like an epistemic action. Sometimes it will be a pragmatic action. But maybe fundamentally these are just the same thing. Um, this relates to well-known work by you and Diane on the difference between the expected uncertainties and the unexpected uncertainties. So, you know, expected uncertainties are the kind of thing that you can work with. So, let's just run a little scenario like that. Suppose I've got a goal, see the new Avengers movie tonight. If you're a PP kind of person, you translate that into a strong prediction that I'm going to see the Avengers movie tonight. To make that prediction come true, which is how action works on these stories, actions are just another device to reduce prediction error by bringing about the state of affairs that you've predicted, um, then I actually need to improve my state of information because I don't know where the move is showing. So epistemic action, from a folksy perspective, will now prevail. I Google the movie times. I now strongly predict that I'll attend the nearby 8 p.m. showing. That new prediction will then act as another goal, yielding further activity. Maybe I consult the web so that I find what sort of bus I'm going to get. And at some point, then one of those predictions, the most proximally efficient one, is going to enslave some motor action um, when it's time for me to leave the house and go and get the bus. So that's how these things look on that, uh, on that kind of model. And I think that head swaying to improve optic flow is just the same thing. Um, it's a well-learned, fast time scale version of Googling for the movie times. It's an action selected to reduce expected prediction error relative to a goal. So that's just bringing these things into a, a single perspective. There's a deep continuity, if this picture's right, between all that eco frugal ecological pickup stuff and stuff like um, Googling for movie times. If that's true, I think that's uh, an advance, bringing all that together. And there's a bunch of simulations that suggest that you can at least, in principle, you, or in practice, in simulations, you can get these sorts of results out of translating stuff into predictions, some of which you um, bring about by action. And so there's, uh, there's a bunch of these little simulations. Friston and Wrigley have done a lot of them. Parr and Friston have done some. Um, they've simulated rat navigation. They've simulated active vision. So it's sort of showing that the way that you um, saccade around the scene is very carefully sort of keyed to why you need to retrieve information from that scene according to what you're trying to do. Um, agents like that, their simulated agents, will sometimes make their practical situation worse in order to do better. Um, so, you know, the navigating human agent and the simulated rats there could walk away from, in a, in a direction they know is further away from their target in order to reach a spot from which they know that they have a good route back to the place that they're trying to go. So you make your situation worse in order to do better. So the thought there is that they're just not that different. It's just reducing expected prediction error over time and this folds in goals because they're just more predicted states. So there's that sort of unifying elegance that I find um, very appealing. Moreover, if you look at the simulations here, they don't just do these things. I mean, they give you kind of fundamental broadly speaking, Bayesian reasons, why you would take an epistemic action now, a pragmatic action now, another epistemic action then. And so that profile um, comes out. It's no longer just a sort of grab bag of, you know, I might do something pragmatic, I might do something epistemic, I don't know, I'll just toss a coin. It's much more systematic. So that, I think, gives you a direct route to what I now think of as the way that the extended mind really works. Um, so... Agents like that are really, really well placed to trade real-world action against onboard computation. So they can, for example, fold in the use of a calculator by estimating that relative to the tasks they're trying to perform, grabbing the calculator now is the best way to reduce expected uncertainties. And that seems like a perfectly good way 
to think about this, a lot of things. Otto's use of the notebook, the, the abacus case, they all seem to fall out there. If you fear that there might be something too brain-bound going on here, again, pushed back in, because who's estimating all these uncertainties and where is it? I'll come to that later. Okay. So, at the moment at least, the thought is you can work in as much structure and scaffolding in the world as you like this way. So as long as you've got a sufficiently deep temporal horizon and you're broadly speaking bright enough, then you can start to develop inner strategies that fold in the use of all of these um, bio-external strategies. The use of a compass is an example that Barbara was giving. Otto scribbling, yeah, Otto scribbling while you're thinking, gesturing while you're reasoning, the whole spectrum of these cases should emerge in, and, and for the same fundamental reasons. So one reason that I like that, that I'm keen on those simulations in particular, is that it solves something that was left dangling in Supersizing the Mind, a kind of recruitment puzzle. So I had in Supersizing the Mind, I had P, the principle of ecological assembly, and P says the canny cognizer likes to recruit on the spot whatever mix of problem-solving resources will yield an acceptable result with a minimum of effort. But that was a kind of puzzle. Even in Supersizing the Mind, I was sort of saying, look, it's a whole new set of puzzles, an ill-understood process of recruitment that soft assembles the problem, the, the candidate solution, using all these things that look very heterogeneous, they look very different. You know, a little bit of neural, neural stuff, a little bit of a perception-y thing, a, bit of a, a little bit of a self-stimulating cycle. Um, but all of these things could be brought about using this kind of um, reduce expected prediction error over time, a uh, kind of bedrock, without the benefit of a central controller. So, in a way, you're orchestrated here moment by moment just by, um, just by the prediction error signal. The prediction error signal, moment by moment, recruits the mixes of resources that will do best at minimizing error over whatever time scales you have command of relative to whatever goals are currently positioned in that high-precision kind of way. So I don't think there's a central controller here either, but I'll come back to that, because um, getting rid of the central controller is really important. If you need a central controller, um, I would be uh, unhappy about it. Okay. So, the principle of recruitment here is you use estimated uncertainty to select the webs of resources that you need. And you hold all that together, you get the actions to unfold that will pull up the resources that you need at the right time by the variable precision weighting trick. So what precision weighting does, as many people in here know and some might not, is it determines in these, in these models the way that information flows within the brain, but it also determines the actions that you perform. So that means that the actions will then fold in whatever is out there that is estimated to reduce prediction error relative to high precision current goals. Um, and in a way then your web of inner resources and the kind of the stuff that is inner and outer and bodily and involves closing that perception action loop, they're all recruited in the same sort of way and for the same fundamental reasons. So gathering together, as it were, the right bunch of neuronal stuff isn't very different, I think, to gathering together the right neuronal stuff plus doing a little bit of worldly action. I think it's just the same thing. It's the same, it's the same process unfolding. Exactly. That's trying to say it another way with a picture of a notebook with neurons on it. <laughs> there you go. Um, and there's that, uh, that common currency idea that, you know, the trade-offs between relying on bio-memory and consulting a notebook, you negotiate them by estimating which is the most efficient way of reducing expected prediction error relative to your goals. That's, that's a workable solution. And it doesn't involve a central overseeing system. What it does mean is that you give up a certain conception of free will we could possibly come back to that. I mean, you're just a kind of role, you're just reorganizing again and again around high precision prediction error, and, uh, and that's all you get to be. So, the good thing about self-organizing again and again around high precision prediction error is that you eject the homunculus from the machine. We don't need any of that. You just are that, that role in process. And when you step back and deliberate, that's because that's the best way of minimizing the high precision prediction error that you currently have. That's a little nod to some of the mental action stuff from yesterday. Okay, so, so where in amongst a, a sort of a, a web like that would you locate the individual mind? That's the sort of question that, um, that the extended mind stuff invites us to ask. And I don't think that this solves that problem. 
you know, I think there is, I think there's a, a whole debate about the extended mind is not soluble using an engineering picture of, you know, how brain-body world coalitions arise and dissolve and arise and dissolve. Um, it will still depend on, on how you feel about stuff like how important is the stability of a set of core resources to be in a mind over time or to be in a person over time. Um, you know, if you're Rob Rupert, then you think you identify yourself with a very, very stable core and you'll think, you know, a lot of you, the epistemic actions, if you're Rob Rupert, are firing up non-new stuff as opposed to the way that I would think of them as folding in non-new stuff. Um, sorry, epistemic actions that fire up new stuff. I said that wrong. So that if you're Rob Rupert, then you think that most of your epistemic actions fold in non-new stuff and a few might fire up bits of used stuff, the stuff that, that is statistically normally around when you're identified as, uh, as busy doing something. So even on Rob Rupert's story, my iPhone probably makes the grade, Otto's notebook probably makes the grade, but a bird watcher's occasional notebook will fail. I guess I'm no longer terribly impressed by the issue between transient versus more stable versions of, of the extended mind. I think they're they're all going to flow from the same fundamental principles, and I don't really much care where, where the mind kind of um, lives there. I think I'm moving more and more towards a sort of processy metaphysic for mind, where it's not really, maybe this fits a bit with some things that were said today. There's a, almost a mistake asking it where it is. You know, there's, 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 there's stuff that happens, and there's machinery, a lot of it biological, that helps make it happen. And some of it's non-biological, and we'll look more and more at that as this talk goes on. So the idea would be that the principle of recruitment is the same for all known resources, inner and outer, transient or not, at all time scales. So this is a sort of, it's a, it's a, it gives you the extended mind cases, but I think you don't have to fight so much about whether they're really extended individual mind cases or, or not, as long as as long as stuff is getting done, and that is the stuff that serves the goals and projects that we identify with you as an agent, then I think we're in the right space. Does it? So I think it makes that question, extended or not, a little bit less pressing. We might see mind as just a sort of handy shorthand for the change in sort of results of that process. So maybe it's a kind of, it's a useful, it's a, kind of a sort of, perhaps a useful distortion um, that, that, in the, that helps us project ourselves into the future. The idea of mind as a stable resource is probably itself a kind of inference that, uh, that is actually handy for structuring some of our own actions and interactions. Okay. And if you look at the recruitment process, then I don't think it would be right to say the recruitment process is your mind because the recruitment process is just the thing that is getting the right stuff together at the right time again and again. I think thinking of that as your mind would be weird. That would be like thinking that the boot program of your computer is its mind. Well, it's not. It's the thing that kind of gets stuff up. Um, so think of something like that. Okay, that was uh, that little fundamental bit, which I know you need, to, you need to really steep yourself in predictive processing and these simulations to buy that. But that's why I like it, and that's kind of what I wanted to get on the table. You know, I see it as an elegant way of, of bringing all this stuff together. There are lots of other places that it matches so-called 4E, embodied, embedded, inactive, extended, cognition. Um, one of them is interception, so extraceptive predictions about how the external world is in PP are computed in, in this ongoing interaction with internal predictions, ones about the physiological state of the body, the guts, the heart. Um, so there's a sort of fit here with the James Langer kind of idea that Jesse was talking about um, yesterday, and it came up a bit today too, the inward-looking bodily awareness contributes to felt emotion. Um, what happens though, of course, is it's not just inward-looking bodily awareness because you're contextualizing again and again and again, then the, the role in the kind of role in inference process of that internal information is continuously adjusted according to how you perceive the external, or how you estimate the external world to be. And so that gives you something like cognitive appraisal, gives you a, a kind of a grip, I think, on the nature and significance of your embodied state. It's not just my heart's racing, it's like my heart's racing, you know, because I'm scared or because I'm doing a talk or because I'm extra happy, um, that kind of thing. So I think you get the best of both worlds there and work by Anil Seth, Lisa Feldman Barrett and others explores that. 
Um, there's emerging work in PP that is looking pretty hard at the rhythmic activity of the visceral body. Nice paper by uh, Micah Allen and some others here. Um, there's a little heart doing the thing it does. Um, so my colleague Sarah Garfinkel at, at um, Sussex is very interested in these sort of bodily biorhythms. And if you think about that process of deciding when to sway and when to shoot, seems very likely that that is subtly integrated with the bodily biorhythms themselves, that there's, as, a, as it were, a, you know, a, a, a kind of good point um, at which to, to launch the shot if you're a, a long-distance sniper and so on. Um, so the core idea there is that these rhythms affect the quality of sensing. They affect precision. It's a basic idea in the Allen paper. At each heartbeat, input to the retina is briefly attenuated by a, a blood inflow. And at that moment, of course, the precision of your sensory information falls, and then it increases again. And so there's that sort of rhythm. You would think your, your neural precision estimations should be alert to that. They should factor that in. Um, it's also true that at each cardiorespiratory cycle, there are fluctuations in blood pressure, cerebral blood pressure, that make some neurons spontaneously fire. So you've got a noisier signal at that moment. And again, a really sophisticated precision estimation machine should take that into account. So the idea there would be that all of those biorhythms should be factored right into the generative model that predicts not just the sensory flow, but the precision of the sensory information. So that's, that's kind of pulsing through time with these bodily biorhythms. And that's got a really proper embodied feel to it. Um, so the role of the body in something like precision trajectories through time is, is uh, an area that I think these stories can have a, a good look at. Um, it would help sort out some of the kind of weirdness in this literature. So this is um, stuff that Sarah Garfinkel and Hugo Critchley and others have looked at. Um, basically, you get what looks like some contradictory results. That, um, that, for example, at the very same cardiac phase, you can get either enhancement, neutrality, or suppression of a particular percept. Um, so fearful stimuli but not happy or neutral ones are potentiated on the heartbeat. So why should that be? Well, if you've got this contextualizing machinery in place, then you can make sense of that, I think. Um, basically, what Alan and co are doing here is trying to say, look, your prior beliefs about the domain will determine whether that bit of um, precision fluctuation estimation will have one effect or a different kind of effect. You know, if sensory noise is temporarily increased, then whether you want to risk a false positive or not might very well depend on the situation that you think you're in. So I think it, it, it does make sense. So the idea would be that you get a principled way of exploring the kind of role of the lived human body in the construction of um, mind, perception, and experience. And I think to really appreciate the fit between 4E cognition and PP, then we've got to get away from the idea that the goal of the system is to have a rich internal model, well, depending on what you mean by rich. If by rich you mean something like mirroring, something like an accurate mirror of the world around you, then I don't think that anything like that falls out of these stories. Instead, what the, what the embodied active inference system is trying to do here is just find the actions that best minimize expected prediction error relative to the goals that define you as the organism that you are. So modeling the world isn't an end in itself, it's just a means to doing the right thing at the right time. So that follows directly from the first principles here. Action is the only controllable way we have to alter sensation, and that includes internal actions like thermoregulation too. Altering sensation to stay viable is the whole reason to be a prediction minimizing engine in the first place. And so it's action that the generative model is there to control. It's not perceptual hypothesis selection as such. Um, it's also true then that once you ditch the idea that you're after something like mirroring accuracy, then there's a lot of pressure on these models to be as simple as possible. They should deliver target sensory states at minimal costs. Um, sort of formally, this is because model evidence here is accuracy minus complexity, so simple models beat more complex ones. There is still an issue here somewhere about how you sort of, how you work out whether you should be buying simplicity by, have, by using less internal resources and more use of the world, or, or not. So I think there's still a kind of version of the recruitment problem hanging around, which is something like, how do I estimate simplicity here? You know, is more neural simplicity always the only thing that matters? Um, that's not obvious. 
However, one way or another, utility and simplicity on some metric of simplicity should now trump truth, at least as I understand truth. Um, unnecessary accuracy isn't a good thing. It's costly, obviously, because it's unnecessary accuracy. Overfitting wouldn't be a good thing, so you, want to, you, you might treat stuff that is just noise as signal if you really try and fit every little thing that you think that, uh, that, uh, that you estimate might be out there. Um, and so inaccurate percepts should be sometimes the kind of thing that systems like this come up with. Um, you know, if it's got great biological significance, then risking a number of inaccurate percepts is probably a pretty good thing to do. So the idea would be that there's a single process here simultaneously driving perception and action in these ways that are driven to be to serve action. So they're not really serving perception. Perception is just a means to the end here. And I think this puts a lot of flesh on a picture that goes back to Pat Churchland's work with uh, Ramachandran and Terry Sanofsky back in 1994, the critique of pure vision. Um, there's a relevant contrast here with a popular version of Bayesianism. So there's a, there's a version of Bayesianism in which you've sort of got two separable processes going on. You have a system that first optimally estimates the world, perception, and then it optimizes an action plan given some externally imposed cost function, um, optimal control theory. And that's, I think these PP stories don't look anything like that. These, are, these stories are basically the, the kind of contemporary version of the old sense, think, act cycle. Sort of like, you know, optimally estimate the world, uh, stand there for a long time, optimally estimate the plan, and then, and then go and do it. Um, so again, some people at Sussex have been looking in, in quite a lot of detail at this, showing that this isn't anything like the way that things work under active inference. Active inference agents minimize a weighted mix of prediction errors, um, and basically that weighted mix, moment by moment, determines a perception action sort of balance. So it, it's not that you first, uh, you first do the first perception task, then you do the action. That's definitely not the way that these, these pictures play out. Um, yeah. And indeed, I think there's a sense in which the whole contrast between perception and you could be radical here and say, look, let's just ditch the contrast between perception and action anyway. You know, what you're doing is just um, kind of maximizing the utility of a perception action cycle, if you like. So maybe there's something weird about even making that division in the first place. Um, Baltieri and Buckley at Sussex, uh, or at least this is just Baltieri from his thesis, say, inactive inference, the estimation of hidden states and actions also treated as latent variables, is shared within a single generative model. Action and perception are the minimization of the same quantity with the simultaneous implementation of both, closing the action-perception loop. And that sounds right to me. That, that's what's going on here. So don't be, don't be misled by those sorts of Bayesian approaches out there that first optimally estimate the world and then do optimally generate an action plan. They're not what's going on in, in these stories. OK. Um, so that means that these stories will just downplay accuracy. Um, it's a lot more radical, I think. Uh, it opens the door to the use of a lot of simple, non-veridical models that really serve action. You're not, trying, you're not really trying to capture the generative process. So the generative process is a thing in the world that gives rise to your, um, to your perceptual evidence. You read a lot of the literature, you might think that what you're trying to do is mirror the generative process in the generative model. And I don't think it looks anything like that here. It's more like... The generative model is just the thing that you use to get by in the world, and it can be massively far away from the generative process. In the thesis, Baltieri's thesis that I'm um, internal examiner for, um, presents a bunch of simple simulations comparing more standard approaches with active inference and arguing that this is a fundamental reason why these things sort of um, fit with embodied cognition. Um, in some of those simulations, you can see these active inference PP-ish agents um, appearing to depict their world in some very strange ways. One of them hallucinates springs attached to its body that fulfill its desires. Friston's got an old paper where um, hand-eye uh, hand coordination, I think, involves imagining strings linking your chin to the object or something like that. So these things, which if you try and translate them into, you know, how does that model depict the world, it's very far away from the way that the world actually is, but it doesn't matter because it's getting the right thing done at the right time. So the upshot is this thing. I think you've got now a picture of a unified perceptual motor space that merges state estimation and control, and that's got a, a very, very 
um, close in the perception action loop embodied cognition feel to me. I think if we really worked out the implications of that, we'd see this match pretty well. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a couple of things fairly quickly to get to some worries about it all. Um, there is a good fit here with this sort of more cybernetic vision of PP that Anil Seth and people are, are looking at. You know, they want to say, look, it's all about being a beast machine. And their idea is it's not even fundamentally about getting external action right. It's more fundamentally about keeping your internal stuff in the right place. And so um, it's not just that perception is a means to action. Action is just a means to keeping your inner states in order if you go the whole Anil Seth route. So the upshot for me is what I will call the just good enough prediction principle. The brains of action-oriented, interoceptively informed agents should predict only the utility skewed and minimal stuff necessary given task and context to drive the actions that promote organismic success. So I think something like some sort of minimal prediction, just good enough prediction principle um, is attractive. So now to some worries. Um, one of them from Jakob um, says, look, um, I'm kind of trying to argue for a match between this sort of machinery and frugal, richly embodied minds. Um, but can I really have that? After all, the recruitment process is a pretty high-grade looking cognitive achievement where the inner model plays a huge role. This is pretty much um, Jacob's words. So isn't there, as he says in the, the paper in this volume, a tension between allowing and withholding a role for rich internal models? And I do say stuff like this. I say, look, the main role of a rich internal model is to determine when uh, a frugal one will do. But does that mean that the rich one has to be constantly exerting kind of force? Um, that can sound like another case of uh, trying to have your cake and eat it. But I think I can, just like she can. She's having it and she's eating it. It's okay. You can do it. Um, so, so... So this is where Yaakov says something that I don't believe. So he says, OK, um, to do this trick, you must repeatedly infer when you're in situations where low-cost solutions are viable, and that requires continuous modeling and tracking of all the relevant potential causal interactions across all contexts. That seems to me, that's a sort of hugely intellectualist vision of what might be required in order to do this sort of stuff, which if it really required that, should make you sceptical, I think, of these stories in the first place. But Yaakov says, without the rich model actually and continuously exerting its influence, even in the conditions suitable for quick and dirty processing, there's no principled setting of the gain, the precision on the prediction error signal. So I think that's mistaken. I mean, suppose I'm playing table tennis well. So I've got a good set of precision settings. They're in place. Nothing unexpected is happening. You know, balls are coming at me. I expect certain kinds of errors. I get rid of those errors with well sort of rehearsed, quite low-level tactics. Um, so... Nothing has to push very high up the processing hierarchy there. I'm sort of getting things done, errors are rising, it's getting quashed quite early on. If unexpected surprise occurs, then some errors will get pushed a little bit higher. And that provides a seed for reorganizing the precision matrix so that I weight different kinds of information and hopefully do a bit better. Suddenly realize, you know, oh, they started serving in this kind of weird way, putting weird spin on the wall. Um, so I think that's how we constantly remain poised for sort of nuance. We're sort of ready to become another transient machine. And the machine that I will become is the one that is recruited by errors according to how far up the, up the system they get pushed. So there's a step ladder of predictive control um, depicted by Pazulu and colleagues, and I think there's uh, truth in their step ladder. Where possible, little habit systems guide behavior, and when they fail, you pull in more knowledge-intensive resources, not because a top-down overseeing system is saying, let's pull in more knowledge-intensive resources, but just because the error has gone kind of further through the system because the low-level stuff couldn't get rid of it. So that's, I think, that's how, why these things don't have an intellectualist or central control -y kind of feel to me. So we shouldn't deny that there's immense storage of causal knowledge in an advanced brain, and probably actually quite a lot of it even in a little tiny brain. Um, but moment by moment, what we're doing, I think, is, is we just manifest as sort of special purpose brain-body-world devices that are pretty frugal, and they get things done, and then they just change into another device if prediction error gets pushed further through the system. Sometimes the device you change into is one that is where the prediction error has caused me to... I don't know, pick up the iPhone and look for some information on the iPhone or something. So it's important that self-organizing around precise error 
is the thing here that drives the changes that bring the new machine into place. There's no precision master sitting atop this web deciding, you know, how to reorganize moment by moment. This should be the sort of the way of being a thoroughly self-organizing system. So one last worry, and uh, then I will just end this up with a little dating game. Um, <laughs> so and the worry this time is that precision estimations are doing so much of the hard work that that has to be seen as a core cognitive operation. And so isn't that just like thoroughly brain bound? You know, haven't I just sort of reinvented brain bound by stressing the, the kind of precision estimating operations, even if they're self-organizing? And I think that's kind of true. And that was kind of the picture that was sort of there in supersizing the mind, actually, that there was sort of something biologically um, core about the recruitment process. Uh, so I do think something like that is kind of right, but it's not entirely right. Certainly, our human-built niches do a great job of sort of offloading precision estimation onto the environment. Um, you know, in a way, um, putting cheap cues in the environment, like the warning triangle for the car, that's a good way of, of enabling you to very rapidly estimate that there's some high-precision information over there that you should be attending to. Um, and even if you it's a brand new case, like this one with the frog. I've never seen a sort of, you know, watch out for frogs kind of sign, but I would, you know, I'd know immediately what that, well, I, don't know, I don't know quite what it means, whether they're dangerous or I don't want to run them over, but I kind of know I should be <laughs> alert in a froggy kind of way. So, you know. so there's something systematic here. So these arbitrary structures, they attack, attract attention, they're proxies for precision, um, and a lot of our human-built world has this kind of, this kind of flavor. Urgent fonts, food packages, priestly robes, they're all shortcuts for our precision estimating brains. Um, pattern social practices, stopping at red lights, this is all a sort of bag of tricks for managing precision estimation. So there, I still think there are bags of tricks around, and that's where most of them are. Um, you know, as we behave in the niche, we alter it. And we thus upload more and more of our individual and collective estimations into that world. This dog has created... Uh, Quite a, quite a good desire path around the house um, that it can now follow around and around and around. Um, so when you've got that, that alters the inner model and enables new trade-offs between inner and outer complexity. Um, so that uploading talk, uploading information um, into the niche comes from work by Axel Constant and colleagues, and uh, we're working on a paper with Carl at the moment on trying to do this for the extended mind stuff. So I, I was saying there, in this respect, we might be a bit like some of Barbara's ants that seem to be using a cheap proxy for precision estimation. That bit dropped out of the last talk, but I asked Barbara in the interval, and she said, yeah, well, maybe they are doing some cheap proxy stuff too, but they also look like they're doing something um, much more systematic and principled. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, it's certainly true anyway that we use plenty of proxies, and uh, that our proxies evolve on this socio-cultural time scale, and, and that seems like a really important. If you ask what's special about us, I think that's it. We've got deep temporal models that have somehow let us um, do this kind of stuff. So last thought for, um, for today here for me is that I think that, that there's something missing from the way that Axel and others think about this, which is that they basically just think about offloading stuff from your generative model into the world. Um, but I think that from some of the extended mindy sort of or loopy perspectives, I think we've learned to use our worldly loops to break the grip of our own internal generative model when we estimate that that will be a good thing to do. I think that's something quite interesting to think about there. It's not just offloading. So we could be using the world to transcend the limitations of our own internal generative model. Here's an old example that I think has that, has that sort of flavor. Um, back in 1985, Chambers and Reisberg, followed up by Van Leeuwen and colleagues, showed that... Um, you can often find a new interpretation of an ambiguous image that you can't find in your mind's eye, even if you're a vivid imager, if you're allowed to draw a picture of the thing that you have perfectly well in your mind's eye and then re-inspect it. And so the kind of idea in the, in the Chambers and Reisberg work was that um, once you've seen it one way, so you get a quick glimpse, it's like, uh, how long do they get it? Um, five seconds to see a picture that has an alternative interpretation, but you didn't know it, but you know about pictures with alternative interpretation, so you know, you're a good subject now for the experiment. So you're shown it briefly, uh, maybe you don't know the duck rabbit, um, 
And then you're asked to recall the picture and look for the other interpretation in the picture. And 100% of the people in their high imaging group in that study couldn't find the alternative interpretation in their mind's eye. They were then allowed to draw the picture or asked to draw the picture and look for the alternative interpretation there. And 100% of them could then get the alternative interpretation. So in that case, you know, offloading onto the environment lets you break the grip, the sort of structural grip of your own internal generative model. I think there's something there that we've managed to use our loops into the world to not just offload information from the model into the world, but to continuously break and reform and break and reform the generative model. Maybe a lot of art is trying to do something like that for us. Um, who knows? Yeah. So, you know, what does this do? It lets you spot new juxtapositions. You can try out alternative saccade patterns. You can try out alternative ways of attending. You can, like, yellow highlight different bits of your own work and go back and look at them and then yellow highlight other bits and look at it again. Um, so, you know, these are ways of, of breaking the group of our own internal model, I think. Um, and surely near future collaborations will let us do more of this. This is something rather lovely from um, Shenzhen in China, StyleGAN. Um, which is an adversarial generative system just doing some kind of imaginings of possible, um, possible architectures. Um, so, you know, again, there we'll have, we'll have external systems with their own generative models that we can use to help break the grip of our own internal generative models, and uh, hopefully those hybrids will have powers of their own. So I think there's a lot of exciting work to do there at this sort of intersection, intersection between active inference, embodied, extended, and situated cognition, artificial life, and the study of human AI dynamics. And the hope for me is that what's going to come out of all of this is it will start to see how a science of the messy mind needn't be a messy science. That's been my hope all along, that, yeah, you know, there's all this stuff going on, but there will be a good science of it. Um, so there could be an elegant science of the continuously reassembled, heterogeneously constituted, often extended mind. Oh, yeah. So, okay, that's the end of the main thing. That's the idea. That's where, that's where we should go. Now I'll do the, the little thing, and then, uh, and then we can have discussion. So, Guardian Blind Date, kind of like Modern Love in the New York Times, Messy Mind reports back on the date with Elegant Brain. What were you hoping for? Someone with principles. First impressions, very formal, not my type. What did you talk about? Life, the mind, everything. Any awkward moments? Asked me for some ground rules, and I didn't have any. Describe elegant brain in three words. Neat, ambitious, cryptic. What do you think elegant brain made of you? A bit all over the place. Did you go on somewhere? Famous old London pub called the Helmholtz. If you could change one thing about the evening, what would it be? I'd have suggested we go to Otto's around the corner. The portions are a lot bigger there. And did you kiss? That will be telling at the end. Thank you.